Judy, we are ready whenever you are. Okay. Um, welcome, everybody. I'm just going to um, list the housekeeping rules. Um, so if you could pay attention and follow them, that would be super. So you've all arrived into the event muted so that we don't have any interruptions. Um, then if you have questions, um, use the chat function to ask those questions. And then I will approach each of you and ask if you want to read your own question to Emma, or if not, I'll read that on your behalf. Um, the event is being recorded and live streamed to Facebook and LinkedIn. And now I'm going to pass you over to Professor Fiona Devine, our head of school, to open the event. So thank you very much, Judy, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, really delighted to see so many people here joining us today uh, to hear from our colleague, Professor of Consumption and Society, uh, Professor Emma Bannister, who sits in the Management Science and Marketing Division in Alliance Manchester Business School. Now, in this series, we hear from new and newly promoted professors at AMBS who are delivering their inaugural lectures. Emma was promoted to professor last summer, and this webinar is an opportunity for us in the business school to celebrate her success and for us to hear all about her expertise. So it's lovely to see so many colleagues here today supporting Emma, and of course, from an online audience from across the globe, as you've heard, we're increasingly streaming these events on Facebook, on YouTube and LinkedIn. And it is really great to have such an internationally diverse audience joining us. So thank you for coming along to today's events, wherever you're based. Emma joined Alliance Manchester Business School in 2010, and her research falls into two areas, transformative consumer culture, which focuses on consumer research with this potential for societal impact and consumer culture theory, whereby consumption is explored from a social and cultural point of view. Now, understanding consumption is something that's very important part of marketing as an academic discipline here um, within the business school. Emma has recently completed a British Academy and Leverhulme funded project called Exploring the Transition to Fatherhood, Shared Parental Leave and the Experience of New Fathers. She was also principal investigator on a research fund project funded by an ESRC Impact Accelerator Award partnered with Working Families and the Fatherhood Institute and focused on the development of a video showcase which raises awareness of shared parental leave and families' experiences. In addition to this focus on families, fathers and gender equality, Emma is also engaged in research on motherhood and consumption, alcohol consumption, with a particular focus on young adult non-drinkers and also the consumption experience of army spouses. So in today's lecture, Emma is going to draw in particular on a number of her studies relating to identity, tastes and distastes. In particular, she's going to focus on a recent paper which explores identity refusal in relation to young people who do not drink alcohol, yet refuse to be marked out by their non-participation in what is often an important cultural practice, of course, for young people, but for all ages. So there's going to be plenty of time towards the end of today's session for your questions. As ever, please type them into the chat function at the bottom of your screen as we go through the event. You don't have to hold back. And the discussion and, and questions today will be facilitated by my colleague in MSM, as we call it, Professor Judy Zolkoweski. And I'm sure now that we're very keen to get started. So please let me hand over to Professor Bannister. It's always very nice to say that, Professor Bannister, to begin her presentation. Thank you, Emma. Okay, thanks very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you, Fiona, for that very kind introduction. And also Judy for agreeing to facilitate. It means a lot to have you here. And I also want to thank all of you for attending this lecture. 
Um, thanks to the school for providing me with the opportunity to discuss my research today. And it's actually been quite a useful exercise reflecting back over my various projects and papers and deciding what to talk about. But one thing that I do want to acknowledge at the very start is that much of my work has been conducted in collaboration with others. So when I talk about we in this presentation, I really do mean we, but I'll be referring to different we's at different points. Now, while I've had the pleasure of working with many colleagues throughout my career who've all been very important to me in very different ways, I want to particularly mention and thank two people, two women. Firstly, Professor Margaret Hogg, um, who as well as being my doctoral supervisor, has for many years been an important mentor and collaborator. And this talk draws on some of our earlier work together, which developed out of my PhD. And also Professor Maria Piacentini, who has been very important to me as a friend, a mentor, and also a research collaborator. So some of the more recent work that I'm going to draw on today has been developed and written in collaboration with Maria. So I'd like to thank everyone I've worked closely with on my research, but in particular Margaret and Maria, who I think are here today. I haven't scanned, but I think they're attending today. Um, Judy's nodding. Um, I would, of course, also like to thank my colleagues here at Manchester who've all helped to provide a conducive environment in which to research, teach and work. Oops, how could I could do the slides? Um, so I've posed a question for this lecture and something that might initially seem like a slightly odd or counterintuitive question. And it actually encapsulates something that I've been thinking about and coming back to at various points over the last 20 years. And so by way of introduction, I'm gonna tell you an anecdote. It's something that sparked my interest in this overall topic area. So when I was a child, we didn't have a television. Now, my kids would say, that's because you're so old, mum, nobody had TVs in those days. But actually, that's not true. Everybody we knew had televisions. Not having a TV really made us stand out. And for me, as a child, trying to fit in with my peers at school, it made us stand out for all the wrong reasons. I didn't necessarily have the same cultural reference points as many of the children at school and not consuming television or TV programmes regularly made me feel different. So on the one hand, we have this sense of our family and me in particular, standing out for the wrong reasons, standing out because of something that we didn't consume, television. However, what was also interesting, why I'm telling you this story, is that it was only when I was much older, and I think in my late teens, that I bumped into an old school friend of mine who was attending an evangelical church, actually, near to a, the house of a friend of mine. And we stopped and we were catching up and we were having a chat. And she said, aren't you really religious as well? And I didn't really understand why she would think to ask this. Um, as neither myself nor my family are religious. And it turns out that she was trying to attach meaning to us not having a TV, not consuming television programmes. It had to mean something about myself, my family, our family identity. Now, in this case, she'd got this completely wrong. However, her assumption demonstrates the idea that what we don't consume is often assumed to say something very important about us. And sometimes these things that we reject or we don't consume can be seen to communicate more about us than what we do consume, even when those meanings can be inaccurate as they were in this case. So during this talk, I'm gonna talk about both these things. First of all, I'm gonna make the case for the purposeful communication of meaning through what is not consumed. And secondly, I'm gonna flip this on its head and I'm gonna talk about attempts that consumers make to avoid being misrepresented or identified by that which they don't consume. Okay, so it's long been established that our consumption and in particular the products and the brands that we buy and we display is symbolically meaningful. Products and brands serve as means of communication between individuals and their social worlds. And I've put a picture of number, I've put some pictures up here just to sort of show you how this has been explored in consumer research in academic journals. Um, the first is a picture of a Harley Davidson motorcycle and a classic paper by Scouten and McAlexander illustrated how brands can be 
used to denote membership of particular subcultures. So the authors described how they themselves eventually purchased Harley Davidson bikes in order to effectively conduct their participant ethnography and ensure their move from being outsiders who didn't fit or belong to insiders of the Harley Davidson subculture. The picture of the iPhone is to reflect work that was focused on the concept of cool. So Apple is identified as a mainstream brand, which manages to still be perceived as original and authentic, even though it is so popular and mainstream. And it demonstrates how difficult it is to isolate what makes some brands cool and also the dynamic nature of brand meaning. So for example, as brands become more popular, they often lose their cool status. And actually that can be a challenge with some brands operating in subcultural sort of fields. So for example, we mentioned Harley Davidson, how to retain that status within an original market while seeking out new opportunities. Now, sometimes the meanings that are associated with consumption are less straightforward. So I've put this picture up of Kanye West um, in a Trump Make America Great Again cap to illustrate the way in which sometimes consumers play around with the meanings of a particular object. Now, the work I'm referring to here is focused on the ironic use of products and brands. Although actually in the case of Kanye West, I think what was assumed to be ironic consumption turned out to be a reflection of his developing political leanings. Finally, as we can see in the last picture, um, these meanings can actually change over time. And this refers to the US cannabis market, where those operating in legitimate markets, so in this case, medicinal cannabis, have sought to create distance from the product's existing meanings and operations in illegitimate markets, that is recreational drug taking. So products and brands are meaningful and can provide useful communication tools for consumers, yet these meanings are not static, they're negotiated, and they may change over time, as well as meaning different things to different people in different contexts. So we've established that products and brands carry meaning and that this meaning is not only informed by clever marketing activities, as with the case of the iPhone and medicinal cannabis, but also by the groups or the types of people who use them. So, for example, celebrities like Kanye West and also the uh, members of the Harley Davidson subculture. And we can probably all think of examples of when the meanings associated with particular brands can change. So for example, Burberry's upmarket status was challenged when it became identified with a customer base that had very different tastes. It became associated with a more brash image that was incongruent with how their established customer segment saw themselves. And this connects with how myself and Margaret started to look at understanding consumers' dislikes and distastes. Building on understandings of identity as dynamic and also the sense of there being very many different versions of self associated with different roles and situations in our lives. So we use the psychological concept of possible cells in order to understand how products and brands can come to be associated with negative identities. So the idea here is that we all have a range of different selves which provide us with the goals, the aspirations, the motives, but also the fears and the threats and other information that help give direction to our lives. And we're motivated to approach positive possible selves while also avoiding negative ones. And we use products and brands as props in this process. So we can start to get a sense that we reject that what we what we sort of choose to reject and our dislikes that is not consuming not doing not being can contribute to identity in the same way that it's been traditionally assumed that positive choices do now while there hasn't been that much work focused on these more negative possible selves the psychologist david ogilvy published early work on what he named the undesired self and drawing on a small quantitative study, he suggested that life satisfaction is more of a function of one's perceived distance from negative outcomes and circumstances than necessarily being close to ideal selves, so necessarily close to more positive selves. So if we go back to the example of Burberry, we can see that when it became associated with a more down market customer base, so-called chav culture, this was basically the antithesis of its heritage brand values. 
and its traditional customer base. And it essentially represented an undesired self or an avoidant reference group to that traditional segment. So how did we build on this? Um, in a series of qualitative studies focused on young adults' fashion consumption, we started to develop more of a sense of how we don't buy, how we don't consume and don't want to be. And we suggested this is linked to multiple not me's. And we developed more of a sense of this undesired self and we termed this so not me in view of it embodying the most extreme notions of rejection. So it was heavily stereotyped. It included all kinds of views about the kinds of products, the brands and the behaviours that are associated with these worst views of self. So if I give an example here of um, an exchange between two um, young men, they're talking about what they termed Essex boys, who for them represented an outgroup. Now, this interview was actually carried out in East London, so it also illustrates how the negative cells that are perhaps most strongly felt and visualised are often those that could be me. So for the, those of you from different geographical reasons, East London and Essex are very close to each other. And this extract includes notions of brands, behaviours, tastes and preferences, and of course is heavily stereotyped. And they discuss kind of sh shying away from this kind of consumption on what they termed an Essex boy image, and this helped them to better figure out their own more positive identity. The avoidant self, on the other hand, embodied less strong views about not me. It tended to incorporate images that were seen as negative, one applied to oneself, but potentially viewed positively on other people. So this could be to do with age, it could be to do with context, job, and it was different to the out and out rejection that was associated with the undesired self. Now in both these cases, there was a sense that when consumers reject goods on the basis of their symbolic meanings, this becomes key to how consumers define themselves and then building their more positive self-identities. And in fact, the participants in our studies often had a much stronger view of what they were not and therefore what they should not consume. And often they weren't particularly able to even describe their tastes or describe who they were without reference to who they were not. So in terms of sort of how this works in practice, the participants in our studies talked about using approach and avoidance behaviours that is consuming and not consuming to kind of tread a line between positive and negative possible selves. So they're taking their cues not only from marketing information, but also from other individuals, groups, associated stereotypes, asking themselves, how closely do I want to be associated with that kind of image? And these quotes give the sense of treading this middle ground, the idea of shying away from one and trying to achieve the other, and the idea of not standing out for the wrong reasons. And if we consider again the work I referred to um, focused on cool brands, while something like Apple might be considered a safe choice for many consumers, if we consider lesser known brands, so for example, non-mainstream brands, even if they are considered cool, they might also be considered risky. Now, for young people who are still developing their identity, the idea of getting it wrong and standing out often means being seen as not cool is a far safer option than seeking to be. Being seen as not, yeah, not not cool, that should be, is a far safer option than seeking to be cool. And I see this with my um, teenage son and the clothing that him and his friends wear. They sort of wear streetwear, they wear dark colours, they wear black hoodies, that kind of thing. And whenever I sort of try and inject some colour into his repertoire, it inevitably ends up in a heap on his floor and worn. OK, so where we end up is this acknowledgement that not consuming impacts identity and not consuming means something. And in this framework, we try to bring this all together, in particular, a sense of how consumers work with both positive and negative imagery in establishing their identity in symbolic contexts. So essentially arguing that as well as being what we do consume, which we're not questioning that, you know, we're saying, yes, that seems to be the case as well. Of course, it's the case. What we don't consume 
also plays a very important role in our identity work. So we get this sense of approaching avoidance behaviours as consumers navigate between these positive and negative aspects of identity and constantly asking themselves, is this all right? Is this how I want to be seen and understood? Now, the un underlying assumption here is that we normally consume to maintain and protect self-esteem. So we want to feel good about ourselves. And um, we've also sort of incorporated on this framework the extent to which these symbolic meanings are also informed by social environments, individual contexts and marketing activities. However, as we move into the second part of the presentation, I want to pose a question. I might regret um, doing this because it means I've got to look at the chat, but I want to sort of ask you all, what do you think when someone tells you that they do not drink alcohol? And I don't know if you want to, you know, just the first thing you think of, if you can just kind of stick it in the chat and see what people come up with. <laughs> Clean living millennials, religious. It's their choice. Very peculiar, no strong opinion, health conscious. <laughs> the horror. <laughs> OK, so there's a few um, different things coming up here. Actually, there's um, there's more. I, I kind of thought that actually as we're a, I don't want to be rude or cast aspersions on anyone, particularly as I haven't looked in detail at who's in the audience. But because we're likely to be a slightly older audience than the consumers that I'm going to talk about, I thought there might be more people sort of saying, oh, I really don't think anything. And I think about half and half people sort of are associating that with particular identities, sort of clean living, healthy. There's a couple of borings in there. Um, and but one thing that I would say is in terms of a sort of a different context, the undergraduate student context, not drinking certainly can mark out students as different. And this is what I'm going to talk to you about in a little bit more detail. OK, so first of all, some really brief background here. Um, tackling alcohol consumption has remained high on the policy agenda, but actually recent statistics suggest a fairly complex picture. And in recent years, there's been a plateauing of alcohol consumption amongst young people. And British 16 to 24 year olds are less likely to drink than any other older age groups. But at the same time, consumption on their heaviest drinking day tends to be higher. So there are some young, young um, people who are tending to drink in very large quantities, despite decreasing consumption elsewhere within the population, okay? Um, and also while the undergraduate population is becoming increasingly diverse in terms of ethnic and religious backgrounds, which of course will impact on the alcohol consumption of some people, there's still this lingering view in the UK that your undergraduate years are the time to party, have a good time, and that alcohol consumption plays an important part in this. Against this backdrop, there's actually been increasing attention given to the experiences of young people who do not drink. A, to sort of understand their behaviours and how they experience this, but also in terms of sort of thinking about ways to kind of impact or influence those who are drinking excessively. Um, the experiences of non-drinkers is seen as a particular challenge in so-called wet cultures. So places like the UK, Australia, the United States, and that's where most of this research has been focused. And one of the main issues that emerges in these countries is this idea of a collective non-drinking identity with assumed shared practices. So this non-drinking identity is often negatively stereotyped, it's seen as unsociable and thus as a spoilt or a stigmatised identity. So it's therefore well established that non-drinkers are understood on the basis of something that they don't consume. Now, most research, including previous research by myself and Maria, points to the challenges that are faced by those experiencing being a non-drinker in the social sphere and themes of not belonging, social exclusion and social stigma and an emphasis on how non-drinkers manage or cope with this identity. And that those are sort of two of the publications that Maria and I have completed. So... In this previous research, including our own, within the undergraduate student context, 
drinking alcohol is normalised and the act of not drinking alcohol is experienced as potentially problematic and involving considerable negotiation and management. But what I'm going to talk to you about now is a study where we saw something quite different going on amongst that population. In contrast to the view that I've put across in the first part of the presentation about not consuming has been a really significant part of consumers' identity work, I'm now going to look at a segment of non-consumers of alcohol who refuse to be identified by that which they don't consume. So these research questions here are mainly focused on the practicalities of being a non-drinking student, but also speak to theoretical questions regarding the inevitability of communication about one's identity when consuming a product that is widely considered to be symbolic. So in effect, here I'm questioning the statement that we are what we don't consume. So really, we'd set ourselves a bit of a challenge of understanding situations when not consuming something, even when that product is widely considered to be culturally significant, is considered not relevant for identity. Situations where individuals refuse the associated identity. Now, what much of the research that I'd done with Margaret Hogg was relevant, it actually didn't explain this. We'd really focused on consumers' purposeful resistance or rejection of particular items. Really, what we were asking ourselves, what could be appropriate to get, we were asking ourselves, like, what could we could use to get started on something meaning, for well, something meaning nothing? And this is where a sociologist called Susie Scott came in useful. Now, anyone who's got teenagers will recognize the response to the question what are you doing? And the answer, nothing. Now, Scott has been exploring just this. In work broadly concerned with things that didn't happen in individuals' lives, relationships that didn't happen, babies that weren't born, careers never pursued, she explored the concept of nothingness, things that are not there. And she developed this in two ways. She talked about acts of commission when we choose to avoid or being something. And this is very much like the active disengagement that Margaret and myself looked at previously and I talked about in the first part of the presentation. This fitted those non-drinkers who were happy to kind of out themselves as non-drinkers. It was seen as an important aspect of who they are as a person. However, what really interested us here was the notion of acts of omission. Now, this was seen to be much more passive. It was a failure to act, ending up in another position by default rather than a conscious intention. Now, in a consumer behaviour context, Margaret Hogg has previously written about anti-choices versus non-choices, with non-choice being linked to affordability, availability and accessibility. But Scott talks about a mission as more in line with not coming up with a position on something. So the idea that the act itself doesn't mean enough to be consciously rejected. So she gives the example of not developing a religious faith that is being agnostic rather than being atheist, which could be in itself considered an act of commission. So the important thing for us in the context of not drinking alcohol was that we had quickly realised that alcohol could be either of those things, but had mostly been explored with respect to commission, okay, with the assumption that non-drinkers have some kind of collective non-drinking identity, which in some, in some way is anti-alcohol consumption and consumers. OK, um, but funnily enough, Scott herself had alluded to the idea of the non-drinker as an exemplar of commission under which a conscious and active decision is made to not drink. So while this idea of demonstrably not drinking may be relevant to some and is perhaps illustrated by some of the language that we use to describe non-drinkers, so we talk about being an abstainer, being a teetotaler, it does not fully capture the range of non-drinking positions. So we decided to look into more situations where people sort of more quietly didn't drink. Acts that might escape notice, not always meaning enough to be seen and not seen as conscious rejection. And one way to look at this is that our focus was on those informants in our study who just do not identify as a drinker of alcohol, 
rather than explicitly identifying as a non-drinker, they're refusing the non-drinker identity that society is putting on them. So I'm just going to sort of show you um, how this was kind of practiced in this context, and this be a little bit of a whistle-stop tour. Um, we developed two main categories of identity refusal. So there was the idea of resistance, which is a very active strategy, rejecting the existence of the non-drinker. That is suggesting that not drinking is a nothing rather than a something. Um, whereas with othering, there was the sense that while they accept the existence of non-drinkers as a thing, they refuse the identity of the non-drinker personally. But in some ways, this feeds the sense that non-drinkers are different and that not drinking is an identity marker. So there's a kind of risk that those people operating through distancing, through othering, are actually bolstering the stereotype that is already in existence. Now, these two positions illustrate how young non-drinkers limit the extent to which them not drinking is seen as having meaning. And therefore, they seek to limit the stigma that is associated with them not drinking. Essentially, they are limiting the extent to which they can be defined by something they don't consume. OK, so first of all, we'll look at um, distancing through resistance. And in consumer behaviour terms, this would involve rejecting the classification of alcohol consumption as a symbolic act, basically rejecting the idea that it even makes sense to talk about non-drinkers. So um, those participants who we saw as um, representing this kind of category downplay the impact that non-drinking has on their social lives. They deny its cultural significance, albeit to different degrees. Now, their identity talk, so the way they kind of discuss this, is a response to others' attempts to attach significance to this something, or rather what they see as a nothing that they see as irrelevant. So they present themselves as regular students, participating in regular student social lives, and they're refusing to let their practices around alcohol impact on their time at university. Um, so we see this as supported through denial and temporal talk. And with denial talk, um, it's really about people kind of essentially saying, well, so what? So non-drinking is seen by this individual here as meaning very little, certainly not as a symbolic act or a cultural marker. She's comparing alcohol with chocolate and kind of demonstrates a failure to more fully appreciate the importance that alcohol plays in many young people's social lives. And while we might kind of think it's, odd if somebody doesn't like chocolate it doesn't really have a sort of stigma attached to it it doesn't really necessarily have an impact on them so there's kind of potentially a failure to identify the the stigma associated with not drinking alcohol and not drinking is presented as incidental and of little interest um, if we look at temporal talk we've understood this as representing just not right now. So it's very much an in the present commitment to not drinking. And it allows non-drinkers to constantly revisit their decision not to drink alcohol and therefore refuse the identity of being a non-drinker in that way. So the, the signal in here is the sort of idea of downplaying not drinking alcohol due to its potentially transient nature and a lack of a clear um, conviction. OK, so if we just now move on to look at distancing through othering, it's slightly different as for these young people, not drunk, drinking is understood as symbolic in some way. It's understood as a thing. Now, there's much more understanding of the cultural relevance of drinking within the university setting, but resistance of the personal associations with the identity of the typical non-drinker through negative stereotyping. So we've given um, Disconnect Talk the label of I'm not like them. OK, so they're accepting the negative symbolism associated with not drinking and that there exists a typical non-drinker, yet demonstrating its irrelevance to their personal identity work. So this participant here is reporting being able to act the same as everyone else. She won't let her non-consumption impact on the way that she behaves socially. So um, sort of 
participants with um, similar approaches rely on their natural skills to demonstrate sociability and acceptance in the social sphere. Now with concealment, we've understood this as you'll never know. Um, and there's this belief that there's, there's such a thing as a typical non-drinker, but they're determined not to be found out themselves. So they conceal the fact that they don't drink in a number of different ways. So for example, this participant here mixes with a number of different groups. So it doesn't become a kind of pattern that he's always not drinking. He kind of, he sort of hangs out with different groups and he's always got some other reason why he's not drinking on that occasion. And this strategy could actually also be about privacy maintenance. So some of the participants in our study wanted to conceal the reason for not drinking in the first place. So overall, what's going on here is that these young people who do not drink, who do not consume alcohol are actually legitimizing their own position through differentiation. Basically they're saying, I'm not that type of non-drinker. But in doing so, as I said before, they actually risk confirming the negative stereotypes and identities surrounding not drinking. So what I wanted to do now was just return to the um, story that I started with. So my school friend had actually formed an inaccurate impression of me on the basis of our family not having or not consuming television. Just as there is the potential to make a whole load of inaccurate assumptions on the basis of somebody not consuming alcohol, as was revealed in the chat, possibly. Um, and coming back to Scott, what we assume on the basis of not consuming partly depends on the extent to which the product, the brand or the object is seen as a something. So the extent to which the consumption um, the consumption act or the behaviour is considered to signify something. So for some of our identity refusers, they're actually saying alcohol itself was the nothing. It wasn't symbolic. For others, it was more about misidentification, which I guess was the case with myself and the television. I knew that not having a TV was meaningful, but it wasn't a decision that I had personally taken. So instantly, after this interaction with a school friend about not having the TV, I did ask my parents more about the decision not to have a TV when I was growing up. And it turns out that this was primarily based on my dad realising that he would get addicted to watching TV and wanting to remove the temptation. Now, this is actually even more strange as given... Um, like during my childhood, my dad was actually completing an open university undergraduate degree. And for those of us who can remember back that far, this was well before the internet, it was well before online learning. And actually what this meant he had to do was he had to watch um, television next door to sort of see all his online learning for the open university degree. So um I'm sort of now actually reflecting on this further or those evenings when he was going next door to kind of um, spot up on his education. And I think that perhaps the real meanings associated with this element of not consuming were to do with wanting to escape the chaos of a young family. So it did mean something, but something perhaps quite differently to um, what was assumed. So I just wanted to sort of, um, you know, obviously there are lots of implications in terms of the alcohol context, but I thought it would be quite useful to kind of think about the different elements of this that can be usefully explored in other contexts. What really interests me is the question of how something that initially seems like a nothing becomes a something. That is, it becomes seen as something symbolic and entrenched with deep cultural significance and meanings attached. And this is the case with the television. It's the case with the alcohol, the clothes, the brands we don't buy. And why is it so important that we don't consume? Why are these non-becomings so interesting? And is it really possible to refuse these identity associations as with the alcohol study? So thinking about the context of COVID, and here I'm particularly thinking about the UK, there are a number of different ways I think this can be applied. And I keep thinking back to March 2020, where the wearing of face coverings outside of a healthcare setting was not an established habit. I remember a handful of University of Manchester students were regularly wearing um, face masks, and this stood out as unusual. The wearing of a mask was something, the thing that made people stand out. 
Then as we learned more and more about the spread of the virus and the numbers went up, the advice changed and we were encouraged or even obliged to wear masks in indoor settings. So, of course, some people didn't wear masks and not wearing a mask became a something. Not wearing masks can be understood in similar ways to not drinking alcohol, even though it's a very different context. There are also culturally legitimate reasons for non-mask wearing, yet as with alcohol consumption, often these are unseen and they might reveal aspects of individuals' lives that they're unwilling to share, for example, exemptions because of particular disabilities. So not wearing a mask actually demonstrates how we can act by not acting. However, this has recently become even more confused given the guidance has changed and actually in the area of mask wearing, there's been a change of cultural norms. In one setting, not wearing a mask could be seen as slightly deviant and in another, it's the wearing of masks that goes against the norm. We can apply a similar thing to vaccinations and many other aspects of individuals' daily lives which have become politicised. And as our society has become more polarised, we're currently thinking in very black and white ways about issues. So, for example, discussions around COVID vaccinations have become seen as pro or anti-vax, not really allowing for the range of identity positions which emerged in our discussions or the extent to which people even see such issues as something as culturally meaningful. So for example, in most other situations, delaying consumption or delaying a decision would be seen as just that. But in terms of vaccination, it's seen as an active and a symbolic choice. So to conclude, a focus on not consuming and not being can actually help us to work through some of these behaviors and look at things from different angles. Often we're so entrenched in our own cultures and their associated meaning systems that we can't acknowledge or understand different ways of being, doing, or most importantly here, not doing, not being, and not signifying. Okay, and so thank you so much for listening so attentively. Probably helped that you were muted, <laughs> but um, just, yeah, wanted to open it up to questions and over to Judy, I think. Oh, you're muted, Judy. You still are. Judy, you're muted. I'm talking away to myself <laughs> and I'm muted, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm no as a host, I'll demote myself. So we've got a number of um, messages coming in. Um, Fiona was the first person with a question, so I might let Fiona go first, and then I'll, no. Okay. Was very I, th I thought I'd start off um, the conversation, Emma. Um, really interested by your talk, not least because of issues to do with growing up with restricted television use, at least, with one justification being you can't watch too much television or you'd be addict addicted to the soaps, so you can't do that. And also about limited alcohol uh, consumption in, in the household in which I grew up and how that was associated, the challenges of then dealing with that, for, for, say, for my parents in terms of um, people considering them unsociable for, for not drinking and so on. But the, the issue I was thinking about is a couple of times you talked about things like sort of quiet and loud behaviours, if you like, and in a way you were focusing on what might be required of as quiet behaviours and, and almost ducking and deving, diving and, uh, and, and being under the surface rather than displaying things. And yet, and it's difficult perhaps for you to comment on this, we do live in a world where... There's a lot of discussion about identity politics, and that seems loud where there's a lot of discussion about people wanting to display identity. Now, it might be that there's just a whole spectrum, but I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit on our understanding then of human behaviour in terms of both the quiet and the loud in terms of identity. Yeah, wow. <laughs> I suppose there's a lot to think about there. And yeah, and thank you. I, I will take that away with me as well. But I think there's definitely, you know, obviously the loud behaviour is what, what we take notice of. And then there's the kind of often there's the majority in any kind of debate who are sort of quietly 
making their minds up and going about their business. So um, I don't I don't really know. I mean, I, I mean, I guess it would be a call for more kinds of if we're talking in research terms, the kind of research where you can kind of unpack that quieter behaviour rather than always listening to the loud voices because often I mean I suppose if I relate that to alcohol consumption yes we do listen to the loud people we know kind of many of the reasons why people are sort of very um out there with their with um sort of not drinking and we saw some of it even in the responses in the chat sort of being healthy being this that and the other and we know it um from vaccinations as well so I think for me, I think in terms of understanding human behaviour, it would be sort of deliberately seeking out that sort of, that quieter behaviour, if that makes sense. Yes. And seeking I think it's greater very interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, Fiona. Um, Phil, you've got a, a really interesting question. Um, do you want me to read this out or are you okay with reading this out yourself? That's Phil Shapira. Okay. Um, Phil's got an interesting question, which has started a, a bit of a trend, Ella, so prepare yourself. So oh, he God. said, can you highlight some ways to use insights about non-consumption to positively nudge consumer behaviour, e.g. to reduce consumption of less helpful foods? Okay, can you, I'm looking at it in the chat. Um, to positively I mean I think yeah I think again it's this sort of sense of actually but I mean we sort of do that anyway don't we sort of with I suppose um influencers and celebrities and um social marketing but I think with all of these kind of things with all with sustainability with um healthy foods or whatever often the sort of people who really get it are just sort of more quietly getting on with their lives and um you know sort of acting in a, a more kind of positive way so in terms of sort of thinking about um for promoting more pro-social behavior that becomes a little bit of a, a challenge so non-consumption to positively nudge yeah Okay. I think I don't know I mean I have to sort of think about that a little bit more but I suppose it would be more about sort of highlighting how how people kind of manage and cope with that so um you know sort of promoting the fact that sort of um you know healthy food isn't always the most expensive food and that kind of thing so that people get insight into the sort of everyday lives and maybe the mundane behaviours of the people who are able to kind of maintain that healthier lifestyle, maybe. That's fantastic, thank you. And Maria's got a follow-up question for you on this. So um, Maria's going to ask you the question herself. Maria. Hi, hi Emma, Professor Bannister. Hi. Lovely Hello. presentation. Um, so just building on that, one of the things um, obviously in other projects I'm working on, we often get challenged, like you're doing all this work about identity, you're trying to understand the kind of cultural issues, if you like, about what it is to be or not be. And we often get asked, how does that fit with nudge and sort of behavioral economics perspective, which is very much used if you look at all the sage advice for masks, and vaccines and things, it's very much about nudge theory. And it builds a wee bit on what the previous questioner asked. And we're all, so I'm really picking your brains here because we're always challenged. How does this cultural approach align with behavioral economics kind of approach? So I just wondered if you've got any insights on that that you can help us with. Yeah, I mean, I think from what I know of behavioral economics, which is very little actually, but I'd sort of say there's a, the kind seems to be an emphasis on you know consumers or people as being sort of very rational and kinds of you know coming to decisions with some kind of rationality behind it and I suppose with 
this research and with my research, I don't think people necessarily do behave in that way. And I think when there's been the sort of debate around masks, for example, yes, you can sort of tell people you'll be this much more protected or the risk will be this much lower if you wear a mask. But actually, if you're if you sort of go into a room and nobody else is wearing a mask, all of that goes out the window not to everybody but I think sort of understanding that we're kind of social beings who are influenced by those around us different contexts and again I'd sort of say really kind of tapping into um, how people live and not just how people think in an ideal world but actually how do they sort of behave when they're presented with those those kind of situations so kind of using different kinds of research methods I graphic methods where you're kind of actually observing people rather than asking them questions maybe I don't know if that <laughs> answers the question but um. thanks so much Emma I've got a, another question for you now from Misha who is asking um as a brand the, does this mean you may distance yourself from a particular behaviour. As a what, sorry? As a brand. Oh, right, okay. Yeah, I mean, it was really interesting with Burberry um, because actually they made a lot of um, money out of become, becoming associated with a, a different... I mean, I know that's sort of slightly different maybe to what, what you're sort of asking, but in terms of sort of becoming associated with something that they saw as negative, they ended up making a lot of money out of that. So it was kind of... Um, and they managed to sort of... Because we, we kind of saw that as happening within the UK market, but actually they had this much wider market, which was kind of not impacted by that. So I kind of, I suppose it sort of, it depends on the particular situation, but I think for Burberry, it wasn't, it, you know, they, they did end up sort of getting somebody new in to sort of reignite the image, but I don't think it was as big disaster as everybody had um, predicted. That's great. Thank you, um, Emma. Alex has got a question for you. I don't know um, if Alex, Alex, are you going to ask your question? Uh, sure, I can do that. Right. That's fine. It, it, it just, it, it seems, uh, I, I was trying to map this onto like the, the vax question and think this through. And it seems like it's, maybe it's a little asymmetric there. So like for the pro-vaxxers, I mean, it's probably an identity thing for some people, like I'm not one of those people, but I think possibly for most, it's just seen as a totally pragmatic, like I don't want to get sick. I don't want to make people sick, therefore, like logically. Whereas on the other side, some the, the, the people seem to be making this distinction between anti-vaxxers versus, you know, hesitant, vaccine hesitant people, where, you know, where the anti-vaxxers, it's like very much an identity, right? You cannot talk them out of it. There is no case you can build because... It's, 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 as you say, it's this defining yourself by what you don't do, whereas the vaccine hesitants are just, you know, it's, they're a bit fearful or reticent or it's too inconvenient or they're not quite sure. And, you know, there's more of a push pull and it's, it, so uh, it just seems, is it a tidy mapping? I don't know. Uh, it just got me thinking. Is it a what thing? Sorry, that is, last... it, is, it, is, like a, is it a tidy mapping like that? Is it a useful mapping? Um... How much do you think, how much do you get this distinction between sort of like for the people where you go, yeah, it's just not an identity. Is it just a pragmatic concern for them or how does that play? I think I think there would be a number. I mean, I think what, what you just explained there fits very nicely onto the idea of commission and emission. So for those who are sort of vaccine hesitant or um or even even you know sort of think longer term they don't don't want to get a vaccination some of them won't see it as a particularly significant thing they won't see it as having um particular culture meaning they'd sort of say well I didn't get a flow jab last year what's what's the difference between that whereas the anti-vaxxers and it goes back to what Fiona was saying at the beginning of the kinds of the loud identity, you know, they they really want to get themselves heard, but unfortunately, 
you know, perhaps we might kind of, as it becomes polarised like that, we might miss the the kind of nuances, if you like, of why other people aren't getting the vaccine. And we might, we might um, you know, miss the opportunity to actually encourage them to do so. Um, I mean, that's it's probably vaccinations is less of a good example of that because actually we are really focused on those vaccine hesitant um, people because I think we've realised that that is something that needs to be looked at. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, Sherry, um, you've got a, a question which you said you'll try to read out. Um, if you've got lots of interference, I'll take over. But if you'd like to ask Emma your question, please go ahead. Hi, Emma. Uh, it's Kerry. Hi. Hope you can uh, hear me. Um, I just thought that was a fantastic um, presentation. Thank you. Um, and your, your discussion of uh, people not consuming got me thinking about ethical consumption and how we might understand people's choices, particularly those who've got a kind of strong sense of the climate crisis. So you, there you might have the absence of consumption as a very socially meaningful thing in choosing to consume less. Um, and then, But then with ethical consumption, you also have people still consuming, but choosing a particular type of thing that they want to, to put their money into in opposition to other people's types of consumption. So there, there is a kind of a consumption still going on there. I'm thinking, you know, fair trade and sort of very mm. trying to buy uh, more consciously. Um, and so I, I, I sort of almost wondered whether that you needed to <laughs> extend it into thinking about that area. But I just, yeah, I was very interested to hear if you had explored that theme of kind of environmental, environmental consciousness or ethical consumption uh, much in your work so far. Um I haven't, but there has been, so the, the kind of idea of um, not consuming has, has been sort of taken up, obviously, um, by people looking at ethical consumption, the idea of anti-consumption. So this kind of, you know, the sort of strong rejection of particular brands and things like that and there is I mean just I mean this is more kind of anecdotally or whatever and thinking about my own anti-consumption I guess and putting a lot of effort into not buying from Amazon and then actually thinking it's probably a bit misguided in the kind of impact that just little me can kind of make on Amazon's profit and actually perhaps that kind of more pro-consumption is probably a much better way to go but it is a kind of you know I suppose in the in the idea of ethical consumption if that's not an oxymoron there is always that kind of push and pull isn't it how much emphasis do you want to put on the kind of more um this kind of positive consumption as opposed to the negative stuff but I haven't looked at sustainability I know it's a like really obvious application of this but it's not something that I've I've looked at myself okay, thanks Emma that was really interesting but thank you Kerry so I've just got a, two more probably quite quick questions so I think we should be able to squeeze them in the first one's from Hugh who said did the lack of a tv as a child make you rebel did you binge on tv when you left off home or did the habit of no tv watching stick with you well, you'll be reassured to, reassured to know, Hugh, that I actually, I think when I was about 13 or 14, we did in fact get a TV. So I kind of, I think I got it in time for neighbours being <laughs> introduced to the UK market. So no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say I particularly am. I don't watch loads of TV, actually. I don't get time. <laughs> um, but, um, but my dad did. I remember when we got a TV, my dad's prediction about him himself was true and he was sat there with that remote control all the time so maybe maybe there was some some method behind it <laughs> that's great thank you and then just a final question from chloe which i think is a really interesting one that most of us want to know which is if you're planning on continuing this theme of anti-non-consumption in your future research and any new context you want to personally ex explore the concept in? Um, 
Mm. I um I am sort of thinking, I do think that um thinking about something more sort of political, I guess, and thinking about, I mean, I've been sort of thinking about media consumption and um things like that. I do want to sort of think about other contexts. Um, but I was sort of thinking. Um, I have been thinking about our sort of consumption of news and other media, and I think I think this could be some sort of potential there actually. But I, yeah, I need to put some thought into it. So thank you, Emma. Okay. So we've managed to squeeze all the questions in with perfect timing. So I think I can now hand back over to Fiona to close the event. So thank you, Judy. Uh, and thank you very much, Emma, for you know fabulous talk today. I know I found myself really thinking hard about some things that you raised. I'm sure lots of people in the audience will have done as well and, and just had a great discussion with some really interesting questions. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank everybody in the audience that joined us and did ask for those questions. We do have a fantastic series of inaugural lectures planned for the rest of the academic year. And indeed, next week, we will be hearing from Professor Bart Van Ark, who will discuss, be discussing traveling through productivity land. So after several decades of work on productivity issues, Bart will take the audience on this, this lecture on a, through, on a tour through the global productivity land. And he will as, assess what has been learned about the drivers of and barriers to productivity and what he thinks we still need to discover. And I think now in the chat function, we are going to see registration details for that. So I very much hope that you will join us next week. And, and just to thank Emma very much again for a fascinating talk and for Judy for facilitating uh, the discussion. And thank you all very much for joining us this now this evening. Thank you.